Hi, everyone. We've reached that historic moment in the class this semester. This will be the last recording uh, related to electronic spectroscopy of transition metal compounds. So I promised that I would explain why the Laporte selection rule gets relaxed. And I, and I think that a good example to use is this, uh, um, the hexa-agua complex of titanium-3, which is a D1 uh, transition. And if you remember the tanabe sugana diagram for this, the uh, spin-allowed transition is a, a doublet T2G to a doublet EG. And the way that you can immediately tell that this transition is electric dipole forbidden is simple based on the Laporte rule just to begin with, um, because you can't have transitions from G to G. So that tells you immediately without doing any other work that that transition is gonna be forbidden. Um, so, if you didn't know that and you wanted to actually see that the transition dipole allowed, remember what you do. Um, we basically have the ground to excited state and we make the direct product between those two um, with the electric dipole moment operator in the point group. And in this particular case, T1U comprises X, Y, and Z. Uh, so you only need to multiply it by that one E rep. And you know, you basically would do the do the first one. Um, get those E reps, then take all of those answers and then multiply it by the, the second one. But anyway, the direct product in this particular case from, from, that, um, from that result is given here. And immediately what you, what you gather from this is that none of those are totally symmetric. So that's giving you a non-zero, or I should say that gives you a zero answer and therefore um, the transition is forbidden. The only way to get a non-zero answer would be for that direct product to, to basically give you um, A1G. And, it, and unless that happens, there's no other way to fix this problem. Um, so what happens? Well, what you're, what you're do next is what we did a couple of, about probably now going back about two months, is you can figure out what the normal modes of vibration are for the ML6 complex here. And you can actually do that, remember, by doing a full-blown three, you know, full-blown coordinate analysis of the molecule, pull out the rotations and the translations and everything else. The remaining degrees of freedom are all going to be normal modes of vibration. So those are the normal modes of vibration. And, and what I did over here, of course, is I show you in red the coincidences between the vibrations um, from the molecule and what we got from this uh, direct product when you include the dipole moment operator and you recognize the fact that there's two coincidences. It's this T1U and T2U. So there's no other coincidences anywhere else. So none of these other vibrations here can actually couple to that electronic transition to make it allowed. But how do you make it allowed? Well, if this, if this particular electronic transition couples now with either of those vibrational modes, we know, because we already did the direct product up there, that if we multiply this by T1U or T2U, both of those would give us um, the totally symmetric answer. And that tells you that that makes the transition suddenly allowed. And that's really what is known as vibronic coupling. So you're really taking the electronic transition, coupling it to a specific deforming vibration, that deforming vibration lowers the symmetry enough, and, and, and that is what gives you now the loudness in the transition. So in this particular case, if you take an octahedral compound and couple it to either of those modes, it makes that um, T2, uh, the, the doublet T2G transition to the doublet EG transition vibronically allowed, and that's how you get over the Laporte selection rule. So that's my last little bit I will talk about in terms of group theory as well. So you're probably celebrating that now as well. Okay, remaining topics. Um, the only things remaining to, to discuss are gonna be charge transfer transitions. 
So what are those? Well, those are now allowed transitions because they're not between uh, the d orbitals to other d orbitals localized on the metal. So they're no longer ligand field transitions. They're actually going to be charge transfer because an electron is going to be completely transferred from the metal to the ligand or from the ligand uh, to the metal. And those are the two extremes that you're going to have. And then um, these are typically both Laporte and spin allowed. And then the extinction coefficients are massive. And that's like, you know, remember per molar per centimeter. So those are very, very high uh, values in terms of their allowed transitions. And a good example of this is, uh, you know, there's, there's the, the magonate or permanganate ion, right? Um, this is a case where you have um, MN7 plus, and guess what that means? If you have MN7 plus, it's a D0 configuration, and therefore you have no other choice. It has to basically be a ligand to metal charge transfer. So LMCT, I'll show you these on the next page. So that's that you have no D, you have no D electrons, so you can't actually do a metal to ligand charge transfer. It has to be ligand to metal, and it's going to be from you know one of the one of these um, ligands that are effectively oxygen here, because that's the only choice you have. So here's the two here's the two um, general classes of charge transfer transitions. So the metal to ligand charge transfer or MLCT is typically when you have um, filled T2G orbitals and then you have ligand pi star orbitals that then remember these have pi symmetry, those have pi star symmetry. So they end up looking exactly and have the allowedness of a typical pi to pi star transition, which again, if you, you know, have an inversion center, which you do in these octahedral compounds, the good news there is, is the pi orbitals obviously are narrata. They match what's in the in the d orbital, and the pi star orbitals, um, you know, in general, um, or I should say the pi's on the pi orbitals on the metal um, mess that up are ungarata. The pi star orbitals have garata symmetry, and that's kind of going to give you the ligand to metal charge transfer character. Um, or metal to ligand charge transfer character that you expect. In terms of the ligand to metal charge transfer transitions, the opposite thing happens is where you have now um, electrons that are effectively donated um, to the metal to make the bonds. And you have effectively, those electrons now are in filled orbitals, but you can actually have transitions that are from the, uh, localized effectively on the ligand themselves and then get transferred to the metal and that's known as a ligand to metal charge transfer transition and then that's reversing the polarity of the of the process but ultimately what happens well the metal gets one electron reduced whereas the ligand gets one electron oxidized and then in the metal to ligand charge transfer, effectively what happens is the metal's oxidized in the transition and then the ligand becomes reduced by one electron. There's another type of charge transfer transition, which is electron transfer within a ligand or between ligands. And those are um, typically intraligand charge transfer or interligand charge transfer. But those are not the kind of cases that we typically see. The, the relevant ones for, for you to really um, think about our metal to ligand and ligand to metal charge transfer. And that completes all the discussion I would wanted to have related to electronic spectroscopy and transition metal complexes. Uh, thanks, and to those of you in my class this semester, um, thank you for sticking with me uh, through the end of this semester, which unfortunately had to be completely online. So take care and everybody please stay safe.